Good morning. How are you? hear me okay? Yeah, I even hear me. There we go. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord, for the rain and the beautiful day, this Sabbath. Uh, before we start the Sabbath school lesson today, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we love you. Lord, we ask for your spirit to be here that it's not me teaching, but that you would be teaching, that you would open the ears and the eyes of those, Lord, that are here 
so that they might hear, so they might see. And Lord, you're the only one that, that can do the work in us. So we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be blessed by you. We ask for your angels to be all around us, counteract all the effects of Satan and his demons in our lives and in this church, and uh, help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're on Psalm still, the last week, the last lesson, the wait on the Lord. And as I went through the, the Psalms, again, the, the study this past week, and I, I feel that the Psalms are such a blessing to us. They bring out insights and wisdom from God. And if we, if we study the Psalms, not just read them, but actually study them, and, and like these uh, lessons have done for this last quarter, brought us deeper into His Word, brought us clarity. I just ask that um, we continue with that. The memory text, Psalms 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In the lesson, it tells us, right there at the first paragraph, the spiritual journey has taken us through the experience of awe before the majestic creator, king, and judge, through the joys of divine deliverance, forgiveness, and salvation, through moments of surrender and grief and lament, and through the glorious promises of God's everlasting presence and the anticipation of the unending universal worship of God. Praise the Lord. The journey continued, though, as we live in the hope of the Lord's coming, when our longing for God will find its ultimate fulfillment. If there is a final word that we can draw from the Psalms, it should be, wait on the Lord. He's the one that has the perfect timing. We know that he has a plan for our life, and he's working that plan if we, if we allow him, if we go to him every morning and continue to give ourselves to him, then he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. If we, if we try doing things in our own strength and power, if we haven't learned yet that we don't have any strength, we don't have any power, Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. So this waiting on the Lord, in the second paragraph there, for Sabbath, reading last week. Waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate bidding of one's time. Instead, waiting on the Lord is an act full of trust and faith, a trust and faith revealed in action. Waiting on the Lord transforms our gloomy evenings with the expectancy of the bright morning. It strengthens our hearts with renewed hope and peace. It motivates us to work harder, bringing in the sheaves of plentiful harvest from the Lord's mission fields. Awaiting on the Lord will never put us to shame, but will be richly rewarded because the Lord is faithful to all his promises. The Lord is faithful. Have you found in your life that the Lord is faithful? Amen? Amen. Always. Now, if there's anyone that has something to bring up from our studies, uh, then please, uh, there's a, a microphone over here, because I'm not the only one that has insight and wisdom. God gives it to everyone, and, and we need to all come together and get that insight and wisdom from him. Yeah. Um, I like that, that what the lesson says. It's not like a, just a drudgery while we bide our time, you know, waiting for God. It's when he says wait, 
it's, it's a promise that he will provide in the future, right? When you say wait, it's not like, um, what are you waiting for? It's because I'm gonna give you something when the time is right. Yeah, I think of, sometimes I think of waiting on the Lord as waiting for him to fill me so that I can do the work that he gave me to do. Um, it's not, not always the right time to say things, interact with people and such. You know, I have a, I have unique circumstances in my life just as we all have unique circumstances in our lives. And when we try to work it out in our own strength and power, in our own thinking, then have you guys found the same thing that we end up not being as fulfilled as we can be if we wait on the Lord to provide the answers to to turn a person's thinking. You know, uh, I think about those that have heard the word. Uh, I was just talking to a member this morning, and we're talking about speaking the words of truth to people, and their ears are stopped, and their eyes are closed, and they don't want to know. And there's nothing we can do about it except go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Spirit to work on that heart because uh, that's our job. Our, our job is just to bring out the Word. Our job isn't to convict anyone. The Holy Spirit is here to convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. <laughs> you know, we, that's all we do as we do the work that God gave us to do. To love the unloving and, and uh, and the unrighteous and sinners, <laughs> just as we've been, I've been most of my life. So here we have an opportunity. You know, if I had never heard the word as, as I heard it back there in the, the late 70s, early 80s, I would not have known about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'd still have my mind um, polluted with uh, what I was taught as a child going to Catholic church and, and Catholic schools. And so God didn't leave me there. But it took years for me to have my eyes opened, my ears unplugged. I mean, it wasn't overnight. So the things that we speak now, you know, even after I was shown the messages that we as the Seventh-day Adventist Church have to give people, even at that time, the only thing I could tell the elders that was giving the lessons once a week at my brother's house, that's all I could tell him was, well, now I believe that there is a God and he does love me, but I like what I'm doing. But if you want to pray that God will change me, then I don't mind if you pray for me. And he prayed for me. So that was in the, let's see, when did I get baptized? 1991. So it was years before I was baptized. And even after I was baptized, I still didn't know anything, <laughs> you know. Yes? You're saying that, you know, we need to wait for the Lord. The Lord has to wait for us sometimes. What you're saying is that yeah. this was a process, and God was patient. God was patient. And That's right. Yes. When, when we think about wait on the Lord, I, how many years did I turn my back on him and rebel and not want to know him at all. But he didn't leave me there. And same with you guys. He doesn't leave us where we are. He, he teaches us. He lovingly draws us by his spirit. He doesn't drag us by the neck. You know, he, he shows us the truth and puts, us, puts it into us. And that, that's what I love about uh, Ezekiel where he says, I'll take that stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit within you and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and to keep my judgments and do them. Wow. You know, I, I mean, that's what he does in us. And, and so what do we do? We wait upon him. I still don't know how to keep his statutes and 
and, and judgments and all that stuff. I, you know, that's, but I know that he's doing it in me. <laughs> I know that he's doing it in me but as I go through the word, as we go through these studies, as we understand um, what God does for us. He does the work. What does he expect of us? That we trust him and obey him. It's no different than, than in the beginning. It's always been this way. So this waiting on the Lord, boy, how many people in scripture do we see waiting on the Lord? Um, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, for Joseph and Israel. I mean, all the waiting. And we don't understand everything. The only thing we can do is trust God that he's going to see us through. He's the one who leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He's the one that as we go through the valley of the shadow of death, that he's right there with us, right? His rod and his staff, they comfort me. That, that's his word. So here we are, his people, going, what, what do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do? Yeah, I'm ready to go. And he says, wait, I haven't got you ready for that yet. I don't want to put you into a situation where you're going to stumble and fall and cause others to fall. I want to bring you there whole, loving me, giving my word with love so that, so that, others, so that others can be drawn in to the kingdom through that love. And so God has a plan for our life, doesn't he? Every one of us. And if you read the, this lesson, not only this lesson, but the, the whole lessons in Psalms this, this past quarter, then you get a better understanding than most people in the world, most people in the Christian churches. We're taught in other denominations the way that they have been taught. And in this denomination, hopefully you see we're taught of God. You know, we're not, we're not saying that we're perfect. But what we're saying is that God is the one that is raising us up to be uh, repairers in the breach. That the that work that needs to be done. And he wants to use us in his service to bring other people into the kingdom. You know, the, the commission that Jesus gave. And so this, this waiting on the Lord, not being idle. Or the desperate bidding of one's time. Waiting on the Lord is an act full of trust and faith. A trust and faith revealed in action. Even just coming to church every Sabbath. Even preparing on the preparation day for this day. And some of us have real issues. And so the only thing we can do is go to God and, and ask him to, to help overcome all the issues that we got in our life that are causing us um, hardships. And we actually, here in the United States, we have it easy. We aren't like in other countries where they're not even allowed to congregate, or they're not even allowed to speak the name of Jesus, or study God's word. We have everything we need in this country to build us up, to be able to reach other people where they are, even in our own society that seems to be falling apart all around us. It says in, on uh, Sunday's call of waiting, perhaps one of the greatest stresses in life is the stress of waiting. No matter who we are, where we live, what our station in life is, we all at times must wait for things. From waiting in line at a store, waiting to hear a medical prognosis, we wait which we don't always like doing. You know, 
I don't, I don't really like waiting, but praise the Lord. One of my issues in life was wanting to get ahead of everyone as I'm driving down the road. You know, you got these drivers that they want to know the speed limit or less. And I'm back there saying, hey, I got to get places. I got to do things, which, you know, it's only because I got up later. I didn't regulate the time and here I am rushing. <laughs> But God um, brought me to a point where I had to go to school for truck driving. And uh, when you're driving a big rig and, and you've got all these gears you have to go through, and the first few, you're lucky just to get moving. And so you can't hurry. No matter if you want to hurry or not, you're just going to grind your gears. <laughs> until you get to the point where you realize that, hey, if I just wait, that gear will slide right in. Uh, that next gear will slide right in. I don't even have to do anything. I don't even have to push in on the clutch, the RPMs of the engine. I just know when to do it, and I've changed gears. So God showed me that as I'm driving down the road, I don't need to rush, even if I'm late. It doesn't matter. Just take my time. Look at the scenery every now and then. See how beautiful it is. Talk to God. You know, these things that we take for granted. But I don't rush anymore. I got people come up on me uh, and tailgate me while I'm driving my car. I'm doing more than the speed limit normally, just like many people. And yet, here's somebody that they want to get right on my butt. And they're pushing me. But I just take my eyes off of that rear view mirror and I don't worry about it. I trust in the Lord. He's going to take care of the issue. That guy back there used to be me. <laughs> you know, God will teach him. God taught me. He's teaching us. So we wait on him because we want to receive everything that he has for us. How do we, how do we, become filled so that we can do the work of God. And that takes waiting, and patience. He's the one that's pouring in the oil. He's the one that is bringing us into situations so that we can grow, so that we can get closer to him. In uh, Sunday's lesson again, says, what then about waiting for God? The notion of waiting on the Lord is found not only in the Psalms, but abounds all through the Bible. The operative word in all of this is perseverance. Perseverance is our supreme commitment of refusing to succumb to fear of disappointment that somehow God will not come through for us. How do we come about to that point? It's by that daily... Um, interaction with God, that daily trusting in Him and seeing Him work in our lives. We don't always like the answers we get. You know, we want everything to be perfect and peaceful, no issues. And God says, how can I teach you if I don't bring you through trials and tribulations? I need to bring you through those trials and tribulations so you can see who you really are because we don't even know ourselves. We, uh, we need to put our trust in God that he's going to show us who we are so that we can go to him and say, Lord, I need changed. And could you do it right now, this instant? Oh, wait a second. I'm supposed to wait on you for your timing. Perseverance. Waiting on the Lord is more than just hanging on. Uh, I love that. It's, it's more than just hanging on. What is waiting on the Lord to you guys? You know, you got the, the microphones. What does it mean to wait on the, the Lord? Misha. Um, waiting on the Lord to me means like yeah. hoping and trusting, having faith in the Lord that he's going to perform his promises that he... Uh, wrote in the Bible. Amen. 
Anyone else? So I think about Paul. Yeah. He waited on the Lord, you know, after he was converted, after he was given the commission, after he was taught by Jesus, right? He got the commission, and he goes forth, and he starts doing it. He's stoned, he's shipwrecked, he's whipped, he's beaten, he's thrown in jail. Wow, just waiting on the Lord can get pretty hard, huh? You, you have to have trust before you can wait. And you were just telling about Paul's experience. Time after time after time, the Lord showed him that he was there for him. And even though he suffered, uh, you know, God preserved him. And it's as we have those experiences, our trust in God grows, and then it's, it's possible to wait. It's easier to wait because yeah. we know that he's coming through for us. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I'm here with Joe. He's going to explain to us how to get the Sabbath. Thank you. Yeah. Good in this verse in Psalm 27, it says, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's the here and now, or it's the here and tomorrow. Anyway, it's, you know, in, in this land, it's, it's one thing to say, well, things will work out all right uh, in the kingdom of God after he comes for us. But there are things going on right now that right. show us that God is paying attention. Right. He's fulfilling his promises. That's right. In the land of the living. In the land of the living. He's fulfilling his promises in each one of you. Each one of us as we go through our life as he's guiding us and training us for the mission that he has for us. Each mission is different. Each person's mission is different. I can't do the things my wife does. I don't know if you guys, you know, gentlemen, realize that, but we, a woman is completely different than us. They, they think different than us. They have different roles than us. And they, and they do them well. And when I try to do my wife's part, I find myself saying, I need her. I need her to do that part that she can do because that's not me. You know? And so you are blessed if you have a spouse that loves the Lord and is with you on board and doing um, that mission together with you. You know, uh, if you have that, uh, that's a good part of the battle right there. And without it, that's a struggle. But God, but God, he can do the work. And we just need to wait on him because even in the church, we're not all the same. We're not all in the same mindset. We're not all at the same point in our training. And we look at others and we go, how come you're not up here? You know, where I am, <laughs> you know? Um, there is no up here where I am. God said that we're all the same. You know, he's training each one of us. And when we see one stumbling or having uh, issues, then we should be the ones to help them. Not condemn them, that's Satan's job. Our job is to lift each other up and be patient and wait on the Lord to do the work that needs to be done in the other person and pray for them. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? You know, it's not our job to change nobody. Only God can change a person. That's all we can do with the work that God gives us to do. When he opens a door, an opportunity, then we use that opportunity to do what God has put in our hearts to do. Whether it's to speak, whether it's to act. It's, it's him doing the work. He gets the praise. So waiting on the Lord is more than just hanging on. 
The psalmist waits on many blessings from God, but his yearning to be brought close to his God surpasses any other desire and need in life. Is that us? Do, do we actually want to have a, such a relationship with God that we hear his still small voice? That we see where he's leading us? And that desire that God has to be in our presence, not only in our presence, but he wants to be in us, working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. He wants to be that close to us. And we have to have that same desire and commitment, but we do fall short. God's commitment, he never falls short. <laughs> He never has and never will. You know, uh, we read here, what would it be, one, two, three, fourth, small paragraph on uh, Sunday? Boy, well, only on Sunday. Waiting on the Lord is more, I already read that. As we read in Paul, in this amazing passage in Romans, God and the whole creation are waiting for the renewal of the world and the blessed meeting of God and his people at the end of time. He writes, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. We're all creation is waiting for us. And God is the one that's getting us ready. He's gonna bring it, like I said, and Jude had said, you know, he's going to bring us into his presence with great joy, the work that he's doing. So our work is to trust and obey him. While we're waiting for the ultimate salvation and reunion with God, even as the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, the Lord still abides with his people now through the Holy Spirit. Do we believe that we have the Holy Spirit? You know, that to me took a while. You know? And uh, I thank God that he's brought me to the point where I am in life and the, the settling in of my mind and my heart. And so I, I trust that he is I'm going to continue to do this work and that the Holy Spirit is in me. We're hearing what you guys are saying back there. Claudia? Yeah. We're hearing what you're saying. So anyway, um, we have we have the Holy Spirit in us. Each one of us. If we are a child of God. If we've given our life to God, if we've been baptized, we're told that we receive the Holy Spirit. And if we receive the Holy Spirit, we find that we don't use the Holy Spirit. I can't use the Holy Spirit to do anything. I trust the Holy Spirit to use me in whatever way that he wants to, to give me whatever gifts he wants to give me at whatever time he wants to give them to me. Not somebody telling me, well, this is how you can do this and how you can do that, you know, and, and receive the gift. No, you don't receive the gift unless God, through the Spirit, gives it to you. So we're waiting on God all the time. We're told that Christ's death and resurrection at the first coming is our surety of his second coming. We even have his word saying that he's going to come back and take us to be where he is. He went to prepare a place for us. Waiting. Waiting on the Lord. The Monday. Peace of a weaned child. What do you guys think about this passage? You know, as a weaned child. Where, you know, in Psalm 131, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. 
I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. What does it mean to be a weaned child? Yeah, there's a... Thank you, Tracy. So I think that what we're talking about is uh, when you are young in Christ, you are feeding on the milk. Uh, you're getting the basics. Um, as a weaned child, you're now eating the meat. The, you're getting more deep into what uh, the gospel message is and, and everything else. Amen. So we become as weaned children. And as we children, we're not going to our mother's milk anymore. We're going to the Word of God and eating. And that, that's what we're supposed to be doing each day, going into God's Word, eating, being filled. And not to gluttony, because I've, I've tried to do that and read just as much as I could. <laughs> but if you want to get something out of it, then you have to chew it. You have to bring it in and then chew on it for a while. And what do they call that? Mastication? Mas masticate when you chew and get your saliva mixed in there because that's what's going to help you digest. And that's what we have to do in God's Word. Mull over what we read. Ask the Spirit to give us insight and wisdom because this stuff we don't know. We I mean, didn't live way back in two, three, four thousand years ago understand how a man could have more than one wife, have babies off of multiple women, and still end up being the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, and, and yet in our mind, we go, well, you're supposed to have one wife and, and all this. But we didn't live back there to, during those times to understand what was going on, what the mindset was, and what their relationship with God was, and what they believed. But we're, we're living in this day and age, and we have our mindset, you know, this is right. And uh, only those that, that come in here should have that mindset. And yet, and that's not what God says. That's not what Jesus did when he came, you know. he. He ate and drank with sinners. He interacted with them. I believe it's not what we do at church. It's what we do after church. It's what we do during the rest of the week. It's how we interact with other people. And all of that is given to us by the Spirit, if we're walking in the Spirit. Um, the righteous lift their eyes to God the acknowledgement of God's greatness makes them humble and free from self-seeking and vain ambition. You know, the, I looked at, again, we each have gifts. And if a person like me says, I can never do that. Years ago, before I was a Christian, before I was baptized, my brother tried to send me to, wanted to bring me to um, uh, Toastmasters so that he could use me in his, for his business to speak. And I said, I don't know. It's not in me. I don't, don't want to do that. I don't want to speak to other people. Well, it, it, it's just not in me. So then I was baptized and and I was born again, and next thing I know, I find out that I'm coming to church and I'm preaching, and I'm going into Mule Creek State Prison, and, and I'm ministering to men in there, and, you know, sometimes there's quite a few people actually listening to what I'm saying. You know, right now, maybe there might be one or two online, actually, and those of us here. And I never imagined in my life that I'd be speaking, that I'd be sitting here, you know, how about you, Tracy? That would be sitting and actually teaching. You know, 
going into God's word and bringing things up. And, and yet, I know each of you have gifts, abilities. You can do things. You can speak. You can do the work that needs to be done. And uh, I don't have to go and, and prod you and drag you. That's all we say is uh, we need this done, and it gets done. You know, sometimes we have to wait on the Lord. <laughs> So the metaphor in Psalm 131, like a weaned child with its mother, is a powerful image of one who finds calmness and who is quieted in the embrace of, embrace of God. It points to the loving relationship a child has with its mother at various stages in that child's young life. And we're all going through stages in our relationship with God. And I hope that each one of you has come to the point in your lives that you realize that our Heavenly Father is accessible. Not because of how good we are, but because of the blood of Christ. We can actually, by faith, go to Him on His throne and as a little child, crawl up into His lap and be loved on by Him. You know, sometimes that's the only hug I get. And I know that He wants me to hug Him too and love on him, because that's our God. That's what he put in us. Through weaning us from insubstantial ambitions and pride, God introduces us to the nourishment of solid food, which is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. The childlike trust depicted in Psalm 131 is mature faith that has been tried and tested by the hardships of life and has found God to be faithful and true to his word. That's where I am in my life right now. And I, I pray that each one of you also, and, and even more so. We're told we're gonna come into some hard times and there's gonna only be few that'll be able to stand and we don't know who they are. I don't even know if I'll be one. That's all I can say is God is teaching me and guiding me. He's teaching you and guiding you. There's gonna be some hardships. But we can, when we find that God is true and faithful now, we can trust him then. Amen? Ultimately, we are called to use our experience with God to strengthen his church. That's what we're here for when, when we come together as his people. Isn't it? You know, I know it's nice to come in and, and listen to a sermon, but we're supposed to be going through scripture every day, and being fed every day. So the, the thing that I see when I come into church is that as we come together as, as a cohesive group, as a family and, and love each other as family and be able to talk to each other lovingly and interact with each other. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven little children. Are you a little child yet? Do you realize that that's, that's a great ambition? I remember when I was a child, I had no uh, stresses and worries and everything. Everything was taken care of for me. I got clothes even though they were hand-me-downs and, and I walked around in shoes and had to put a cardboard in to fill in the holes and, and all that stuff. I didn't realize that we were poor. You know, I just realized that I had a mother and father that loved me. I had a place to stay. I got fed. Maybe not always what I wanted or how much I wanted. But that family 
unit is what we are as God's people. And as we see the day approaching, we're supposed to even come together even more. And I don't know about you, but I see the day approaching more than my 73 years I ever have. Me too, Joe. What's that? I said me too. Amen. The past deliverance was so great that it could be described as a dream come true experience. That's from Isaiah 29, 7, 8. I know that my dream come true experience. I didn't realize that I had any dream. Not like that. I didn't know what it meant to be born again. I was just baptized and figured everything would be fine. But God didn't leave me there. He led me to be born again. And uh, so the dream come true. If it hasn't come true for you, if you don't have that dream, then that's the one you need to get on your knees and pray for. And that change that only God can do with us. Reborn by the Spirit. The past joy and relief are relieved, relived through songs and appropriated in present experience. The new generations keep Bible history alive by counting themselves as present among those who saw the events firsthand. You know, you've seen events firsthand in your life and how God has delivered you, how God has brought up this church. Even in some of the failures, we see it regrow. God never leaves us or forsake us. The memory of the past spurs from the renewed hope for the present. On Wednesday, waiting in God's Sabbath rest. The praise of God for the great works of his hands in Psalms 92 and the Eden-like portrayal of the righteous in Psalms 92 clearly points to creation, the first aspect that the Sabbath comm commemorates. The Psalms also magnifies the Lord for his victory over enemies as the God of justice, and so reinforces the second Sabbath theme, redemption from evil. Have you been redeemed from evil? Yes. Yes, by the blood of Christ, we are redeemed. We are, the power of the enemy has been broken in our life. We've been bought and paid for, right? So we are redeemed from evil. That doesn't mean there isn't evil all around us, but just like Job with his family, his prayers kept his family safe, had a hedge of protection around his family. So much so that Satan said to God, the only reason he loves you is because you keep protecting his family. Well, we have, angels all around us, don't we? You know, if God would open our eyes so that we could see angels all around us, protecting us from the evil one. Satan wants in every way to find a way in to get at us. And that's what he seeks for, is that, that little crack where he can get in. And where are those cracks? Our sins, our desire not to give this portion up. You know, these are ways for Satan to get in and undermine us as the pillars that God has us in, a, in his church and in the world. Satan wants to destroy us. He always has from the day that he caused our parents to sin in the garden. Ever since then, he's done everything he can. He brought about the destruction of Israel to the point where Jesus, when he walked out of the temple, says, your house is left to you desolate. I'm out of here. Because they weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping whatever way they wanted to, like Cain.
The people can enjoy Sabbath rest because God is the most high. His superior position on the high places gives him an unparalleled advantage over their enemies. Yet although he is the most high, the Lord readily reaches down to rescue those who call on him. I like the idea of going first thing in the morning and calling on him. Because we need rescue from this world, from the things of this world, the influences of this world, the sinful things that we never expected in our lives. And yet, we even hear about it in our schools in this area. We have such evil. I think that in my life, I've only in the past few years come to the realization that evil has always been here. I just had my eyes closed. I just didn't realize it. And now that my eyes are open and I see it, it's pervasive, it's all around us. So how do we keep ourselves from being polluted by that evil that's all around us? You know? And how did Jesus do it? Because he had the same issues when he was here. Evil all around him. What did he do? Pray. He prayed unceasingly. And he fasted. And he fasted. And commune with his father. He got instruction from his father. And we can go and get instruction from our father. We can go and get that peace that only he can give us to live in this world and have a smile on our face, actual joy in our hearts that we can pass on to other people, that they can see God in us. It's only God that can do it, that in us. And so we need to go to him and be renewed every day. Fresh oil conveys the psalmist renewed devotion to serve God as he, his reconsecrated servant. The anointing with oil was done for consecration of chosen people, such as priests and kings. And yet we're called priests and kings in the kingdom right now. We need that oil. And our high priest in the heavenly, he's the one ministering at the lamp. He's the one that pours the oil into the lamp to keep the light burning. He's the one. Our high priest gives us the oil. If we don't feel that we have enough oil, then he's the one to go to. Right? If you want your light to shine brighter, if you want to be closer to the Lord, all these things that God is doing for us, it is not surprising to find thoughts about consecration in a psalm that is dedicated to the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the sign that God sanctifies his people. God's the one that makes us holy. We can't make ourselves holy. We are powerless. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. And yet still, how many, well, I know for myself, how many times have, do I try to do things in my own strength and power until I realize I need to get on my knees? and get the real power that that only comes from God. Thursday, joy comes in the morning. In the Psalms, morning is typically the time when God's redemption is anticipated. The resurrection morning of Jesus Christ opened the way for the eternal morning of God's salvation for all who believe in his name. As the morning star announces the birth of a new day, so faith heralds the new reality of eternal life in God's children. That is what we are waiting for when we talk about waiting on the Lord. All created beings live by the will and the power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of God. When I first read that, I thought about it. And it came into my mind, yes, I'm dependent on receiving a life from God every day. There's nothing I can do to cause my, myself to live. Only God does it. So... Oh. Our Lord commands 
Our Lord's commandment to wait on him is an impossible one unless he has done his work in us through the Holy Spirit. God can do it. God is doing it. And we are the recipients. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for being right here with us, for your spirit teaching us and guiding us as we went through this lesson. We look forward to next month's lesson, Lord, when again we can go through the great controversy. All these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I ask that the, the deacons and elders... So I'm here with Joe. Today. He's going to explain to us to how the, to get uh, the Sabbath school quarterly. Um, I have it on my iPad. I have it on my iPhone. And you just go into your search for your, for your apps. And you say Sabbath school quarterly. And that's the app. It opens where you, go, where you can go get it. And uh, let's see. Sabbath School Quarterly right here. It's already open. S S Q. And so when I open it, then it comes up to our lessons. Cool. And how do we know which lesson is for what Sabbath? It gives us at the top uh -huh. what the date is. March 16th to 22nd. And then March 16th, does it start with this, this Sabbath or? Sabbath afternoon. Okay. That's when the lesson starts. Uh -huh. So Sabbath is the first day. And then from there, it goes through the rest of the week to Friday. Okay. And then you talk about that lesson that day. That's right, each day. So this one will start today. This is the one we'll start studying today, okay. for Sabbath afternoon. For next week, and then for we'll talk about week. it. Okay, right. cool. So each day, we'll go on from there. Thanks, Joe. Welcome. God bless you. Happy Sabbath, guys.